Okay, so let's say that we have built a kind of a map for possible scenarios of language death in our heads. Before discussing their revival, there's one question we owe ourselves the answer to. Namely, why should we care about it in the first place? Okay, the language Sioux is contracting, but wouldn't it be better and easier if people of the world would speak fewer languages? Maybe that would even lead to a more peaceful and understanding society as dreamed of by many creators of constructed languages, such as Esperanto, which we covered in our third episode. Absolutely not. The political situation in the United States suggests that a common language has absolutely no bearing on conflict or differences of opinion. That's a fallacy, the monolingual fallacy, we call that. Well, the reason that minority communities should be allowed to have these options to at least maintain their language is that there's a very real effect, a social and economic effect of instilling ethnic pride in minority groups. Okay, minority groups are often the poorest, they're often disenfranchised, and this has with it a bunch of social ills which affect the entirety of the society. So this would mean that there's you know, increased uh, drug use or drug and alcohol abuse, there's higher crime rates, higher incarceration rates, lower economic opportunities, lower economic activity. And what we see when we look at, you know, actual studies that show, you know, one group of people who've been allowed to or promote their language uh, in various, you know, institutional ways, uh, whether it's you know bilingual schooling or whatever it is, versus the same communities that don't get that, you see across the board increases in, in the types of social demographic things that you want. That would include, like I said, higher economic growth and higher economic activity, lower incarceration and crime rates, lower drug and alcohol abuse rates. And then from a sort of meta-societal perspective, what we know is that bilingual and multilingual brains on average have onset of dementia four to four and a half years later than monolingual brains do, okay? So there is a whole knock-on effect, not only on the personal social family level, but on the state burden of taking care of more, fewer people that have those types of issues. So like from a government management an economic perspective, there's, there's literally no argument against it. And the old argument of, well, it's too expensive to maintain these languages in a digital world is not a viable or tenable position any longer because it's just as a lot of books that you buy on Amazon or whatever are on demand anyway. So like they print them and, and so it's like we live in an on-demand digital world and that reality is, is real. So there's no reason why these things couldn't be done for 7,000 languages as opposed to 250 languages in the world. The, the arguments against it uh, really are an antiquated understanding of the way that, that materials and things can be promoted. Now, the thing is, is that there are economic opportunities to be had in language revitalization. So for example, creating of audiovisual materials requires technical training, that's a transferable skill. Teacher training, that's a, that gives you not only the ability to teach your language, but to teach other things as well. So there are, there are any number of real world economic opportunities that can be institutionalized uh, with, with effort. And, and, but again, like everything else in this world, it comes down to there's gotta be some money. You need to have money to support these things. That is just the reality of everything is that, you know, but that's the reality of literally everything. You know, the only things that don't need money is um, appreciation of nature, but you can't appreciate nature if people are tearing down nature uh, and raising forests and these kind of things. So even that requires money. Okay, so it's like there's literally nothing that doesn't come down on some level to to economics. Okay, that's as 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 harsh and unpleasant a reality as that is. That that is that is true. If a government uh, official is thinking like, what's the value of this? Long term, strategically, there is significant value in doing these things. It's just getting them to understand all of the different aspects of how that plays out over generations that would be to their advantage. And again, they can still institutionalize their own national languages, but while promoting these other ones. And that, that, that's a win-win situation, you know, to use game theory or whatever. That's a, um, that's a scenario that, that people need to, to hear. And, and, you know, there's another issue here, which I haven't uh, skirted on yet, but it's sort of been lingering, is that it's a human rights issue also. I mean, people have the right to speak their language they choose to speak in the context that the don't affect other people's decisions. 
effects. Like I said, like home languages have no effect on the broader society. Okay, that is a personal decision. That's that's as much a personal decision as you know how long you wear your hair or what clothes you choose to wear or things like that. Okay, so it does not impact the broader society in any way. And if people who think it impacts them are just you know being weird or demented or or intolerant. There's a moral right issue here, a human rights issue, but a lot that that argument doesn't play with a lot of people. Let's be honest, okay. But economic issues again, and political issues do, and these also like no one wants your you know your community to be high crime, okay. Everyone wants to live in a safe place. Maybe there are some crime syndicates that glorify violence and crime and stuff, okay. But they're very micro communities, right? So well, maybe not everybody, but there you know there's most everybody. Uh, wants to live in a, in a place where it's safe and they feel like their children are safe and, and they have clean water. I mean, there's just certain basic realities that people want to have, even if it's not available to everybody, okay? And when you have a relatively simple thing like promoting minority languages that can have this significant knock-on effects, that just seems to me like a no-brainer. Like that's where you've got to put the, some efforts into it because it just is so positive. It, there are basically no negatives. It's the only negatives are from intolerance and zero sum game ideologies of dominant populations. That's the only ne perceived negative. It's not a real negative. It's just a perceived negative. But those negative attitudes are so strong that they get internalized by the communities themselves, and then they want to abandon their points of pride effectively. So, you know, the, the human rights uh, argument doesn't work on everyone. The biomedical reasons might not work on everyone. The, the, but the, the economic reasons are, are, you know, pretty unassailable for most people. That's something that, that, that it comes down to. So in a social economy theory perspective, you know, there's absolutely every reason to promote it. And it does not, as I've already said, discredit nationalist ideologies either. It simply enriches them. 